I'm sort of drafted into this at the last minute. Greg Mandel is a uh, physicist at uh, Lago Hanford. He was going to be here on Monday, uh, but he'll be here on Thursday, Friday, actually, this week. So he's going to give a talk on neutron stars, and I'll give this overview just of uh, uh, advanced LIGO status. So um, it's maybe not quite what you had in mind for the afternoons, which are very targeted, more no, focused. No, no, I think it's all so you, need, you need to wear the mic, I think, as well. Okay. It, oh, okay. I see. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, so thanks for the opportunity uh, to tell you about uh, LIGO status. Cleverly titled here. And um, I've shown here a picture which is kind of near and dear to my heart. This is the uh, installation at one of the end stations. So the LIGO interferometers are L-shaped detectors, 10,000 cubic meter uh, volumed uh, vacuum envelopes. And at the end stations are the test masses, and we're actually looking what will be down, down the arm. Uh, so just ahead upstream here is the final test mass, and this is something called the transmission monitor, which takes light that's leaked through the end mirrors and sends it up onto an optics table. And Corey Gray, one of the operators at Hanford, is down here having a little nap <laughs> while he talks to someone <laughs> waiting <laughs> for some <laughs> external work here. <laughs> he's got a headset and he's talking to him. So that's why I like this, because it means we're almost through this exhausting four-year phase of installation. Um, looking at this set of optics up here, you might say that uh, there's green light. I thought LIGO used infrared light. Um, that's true, but I'll tell you about an injection system for locking the interferometer that is causing it to resonate that uses green light. And you also might think, wow, there's a lot of green scatter there. That's what most experimentalists think when they look at that. Okay, so... Uh, a uh, couple of reminders uh, about the sources that we're looking for. Uh, LIGO and its uh, related sister interferometers throughout the world, Virgo, and what will ultimately be CAGRA, LIGO India, GEO. Um, they're broadband instruments, so they're sensitive to a variety of audio-based uh, waveforms from different sources. And we're all concerned about binary coalescences here, but there's also uh, burst sources that may or may not be uh, able to be modeled. Uh, typically, we think of these as uh, unmodeled sources from supernova, GRBs, the like. Uh, and uh, they, may be tar they may be triggered searches, in which case we have information coming from external uh, sources such as space-based uh, networks of detectors that there's some 
key time in which there's been a burst in, in the sky or not. It could be a very hard search, which is the all-sky, unmodeled, untriggered uh, search. There's also uh, longer-term uh, sources, which are, of course, going to be harder to detect, things like spinning neutron stars, if they had a, qu a quadrupole moment, some semi-hemispherical mountain on the side uh, can produce some nearly uh, monoton monotonic uh, gravitational wave that should be in, the life in your uh, detector for the lifetime of the experiment. And much more unlikely to detect is something, some remnant from something uh, left over from the Big Bang or some exotic cosmology. Of course, we've heard a lot about this because of the bicep result, recent bicep result. And just generally looking at the time frequency plot of what those waveforms look like, the thing we're, we're interested in, of course, are these chirps. Uh, and, and they have some very characteristic thing which isn't likely to happen in your detector as a noise source. That's what makes them highly attractive. They're modeled and they're reasonably unique. We don't have many things that chirp up in the detectors, although of course some things do. And uh, short-term bursts, broadband backgrounds like stochastic ones and quasi-periodic uh, uh, continuous wave sources. Background on LIGO itself, uh, we have four sites. Two of them are observatory sites, sites, Hanford, that's just east of here, and three hours east of here in the desert, uh, Washington, eastern Washington state, and LIGO Livingston in the swamps of Louisiana. Uh, Caltech and MIT are the other two sites. The, the Caltech and MIT uh, jointly uh, designed and uh, built the, the observatories uh, and run the observatories. It's uh, funded by the NSF and then around this group of uh, what, the, what we call the LIGO laboratory, these four sites and the people at, at those sites is the LSC, a group of 900 scientists and engineers um, throughout the world. Uh, and you can see there's a few big holes. Canada is a big hole. Africa is a big hole. And we're working to close some of those. And then there's a the group there. And of course, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, people like Satya and others that work on Sukanta, that work on, uh, some people work on instrument, instrument science, but many work on data analysis. Okay, so here's the heart of what I really want to talk about, which is about the advanced LIGO upgrade. So we completed installing initial, what we call initial LIGO in 2000, and then we commissioned them, that is, the process of making them resonate light and assessing their noise spectra and pushing down the noise curves to make them uh, sensitive to some putative source, some distance in the sky, from 2000 to 2005. And we reached just our design goal in 05, it's just ahead of here, and we ran this two-year calendar year science run integrating a year's worth of triple coincidence data. And that was, so that's three interferometers at two sites. We actually had two interferometers co-located in the same vacuum envelope in Hanford and a single one at, at uh, Livingston. We ran that run, analyzed data, and have not found gravitational waves in those data. And we made uh, some small, modest upgrades to the tune of about $3 million, exploiting what were then prototype advanced LIGO componentry in order to retire some risk and really understand what are the hard parts about advanced LIGO. And I'll show you some of those components that we uh, upgraded and what we have now installed in, in advanced LIGO. We then ran uh, S6, which was about a year and a half or so in calendar years. Just two interferometers, though. And then in October uh, 2010, the advanced LIGO project, as a project had already been started, money had been flowing, Assemblies were being made, parts were being cleaned and baked. All these components go into vacuum ovens to, to be baked to drive out hydrocarbon, predominantly water, that would be loaded in the vacuum envelope unless you didn't tease it out. And so uh, on, in 2010, we then shut down the sites uh, for the installation phase. And that's really what I'm going to tell you about from the October 2010 to about now, in which we progressively made uh, more and more incursions into the vacuum envelope, taking components out, um, putting, installing new hardware, modifying the vacuum envelope, et cetera. And that brings us here to 2014, where we're very near, nearly done. We're, we've installed at LIGO Livingston, 
And we are, we've installed all our components at LIGO Hanford, but we're just aligning the last ones. And uh, in six weeks, five weeks, we'll be done at LIGO Hanford. Okay, so here's, here's a schematic of the LIGO design, cartoon of the LIGO design. So just the, the key components are, are actually very similar to advanced, uh, to initial LIGO, um, but better. 10 times better typically. You have a laser incident on a 50-50 beam splitter which transmits half the light into one arm and reflects half the light up the other. The arms comprise Fabry Perot cavities. So a Fabry Perot cavity is this pair of mirrors where you have a partially transmitting incident mirror and a fully reflecting secondary mirror. And that allows, well, light to couple in, if you hold the, inner, the, the arm at a particular wavelength, n, uh, n lambda by 2, an integral number of half wavelengths, then you achieve a resonance condition such that all the light couples in. If you don't hold it, constrain it, either m mod modifying the laser frequency to match the cavity or the cavity length, then light just dumps and reflects out of the, out of the cavity. And so you'll hear people talk about lock. Lock means you have control over degrees of freedom such that uh, you're, you know, you're mod modifying the laser frequency to match particular cavities. You're modifying cavity lengths to, mo uh, to match the setup. All of this is the process of suppressing noise. If you don't lock the instrument, have control over those multiple, multiple degrees of freedom, you haven't got a working detector. So that's the big deal about lock. If it's not locked, it's not worth anything. And uh, the primary metric for us to reach in advanced LIGO is something called a two-hour two lock. It's, it's all degrees of freedom in the interferometer controlled, including angular ones, and lock for two hours. That's the metric we've been using. It's the thing we promised the National Science Foundation when we got the 205 million for the advanced LIGO upgrade. There's also 55 million in UK and German uh, contributions as well, uh, so 260 overall. But the th thing we promised uh, the NSF was that we would make a two-hour lock. In fact, that two-hour lock was achieved last night. I looked in the advanced LIGO log this morning and found that they had done that. So we're, we're there in some sense. Uh, we already knew we would make that because for the past couple of months we've been locking. And uh, we had locked for something on the order of an hour and a half already. So obviously two hours wasn't going to be a uh, significantly difficult hurdle. But in some sense, that's a proof principle. We've got a lot of noise hunting to do, a lot of work to do between now and them. Uh, but the, the takeaway on locking is that thing ha the thing has moved quickly, and that's good for us. So that was in Amphor or in Livingston? That was in Livingston. And I'll show you that we're, uh, we're dephased in Hanford and Livingston significantly uh, in the installation path, and that's done really because, well, I'll, t I'll tell you about it in a couple of minutes. OK. so. Uh, so it's the same kind of uh, configuration. Uh, there is a power recycling cavity as well. There's, there's uh, coupled uh, fabric perot cavities. You can think of uh, if, if, well, first off, if we lock the interferometer on a dark fringe, that is, null this signal out here, such that if a gravitational wave passed by, you'd leak a little light through the output port. You'd destroy that nice destructive interference you'd set up. Um, that means the power is sent back to the laser, right? And so you, you want to deal with that, that, that you can't let that light get into your laser, it will, it will mess up your laser operations, and it's lost power, it's lost photons to the interferometer. So you couple that back into the interferometer, something called a power cycling cavity, you drop in another one of these partially transmitting mirrors here, you can imagine this as one mirror, and all of this, everything downstream of it as a compound mirror, light is coming back from it. So then that's another degree of freedom you can go ahead and lock. You can servo the position of the power recycling cavity, and that couples light back to the beam splitter, increases the power in the infrarmor. You At the cost of making your, <coughs> your, uh, control, your controls more complex. You have multiple input, multiple output system, coupled system. Uh, and that was used in uh, an initial LIGO as well. We also have the signal recycler, which is another a Fabry Perot cavity, on, coupled cavity on output, which regenerates the signal and couples it back into the interferometer for amplification and then, and then back out. So the whole thing is this power recycled Fabry Perot with signal recycling. Uh, 
Next, uh, what, well, what else is advanced here? Uh, seismic isolation in, in initial LIGO, <laughs> the seismic isolation platforms were, were dead simple. They were springs and masses in, in, in order to decouple the mirrors from the ground. We don't want to be sensitive to seismic motion. Uh, and so putting things on springs and dampers uh, allows the ground to move while the optic stays mostly still. The problem is there's resonances in, in mechanical systems, and so that they're actually anti-isolators at 1 hertz and 2.2 hertz and 6 hertz and 10 hertz. And so that meant uh, we had to work uh, with active controls in order to in advanced LIGO. And so a lot of the capital cost in advanced LIGO goes into this seismic isolation to make the optics very still. And, uh, and it's really the what you're paying. Uh, you still use passive isolation, putting things on springs and, sw and pendula but you also have active controls through voice coil actuation, same way a speaker works with a coil around a permanent magnet. You drive that with a current to, to move the, pa the payload uh, in response to seismic motions or in a f so feedback or in a f feed forward uh, fashion. Um, the active controls you see uh, opens up the low frequency regime for binary black hole uh, detection. Uh, DC readout, in initial LIGO, we didn't do the experiment that we typically tell the public. It's, that's usually we say, you know, the arms wave around and some light leaks through on some photodiodes and you look at that near DC light. In fact, the experiment was done at RF frequencies. So you, you, the carrier frequency of the laser is where the, most of the power of the laser is, but you uh, pass the light through electro-optic modulators and attach sidebands to the light and that allows you to tag light in certain cavities. For instance, certain sidebands resonate in the, uh, in the corner in these small uh, degrees of freedom here so in the corner station, but not in the arms. The carrier light, which is the bulk of the light, resonates in the arms. So the carrier light is sensitive to the modifications of the gravitational wave. The sidebands aren't. So the beat note of the sideband against the carrier, that was the signature of length change in initial LIGO, which looks to us like gravitational waves. So we use that same trick all over in advanced LIGO. So there's all kinds of at uh, attachment of sidebands to resonate both not just length degrees of freedom, but also angular degrees of freedom. And uh, so we use that, but in advanced LIGO, we finally um, output to uh, DC photodiodes uh, and thus subtract the usage of a lot of complicated RF electronics. And that we win in signal to noise by doing that. So this is now doing the experiment that we generally explain. We go to higher power, 200 watts on input instead of, uh, instead of 20 watts. That turns out to be one of the hardest things to do. I'll hit that later. Uh, we go to large test masses, 40 kilogram test masses, in part to, to suppress the radiation pressure that's induced from 700 kilowatts resonating in the arms. And also you want to sample over a large pattern to minimize thermal noise. So you want to sample over a lot of uh, oscillators on the, uh, the front of the optic. And few silica suspensions, the mirrors, in order to reduce the thermal noise, the, the mirrors themselves are suspended by f uh, glass rods from one glass optic to another, so we call it a monolithic uh, suspension system. Uh, uh, stupid yeah. question, why do you always have two mouses per? Yeah, so in fact, the, um, so, okay, so the, if you suspend something on a pendulum, then the transfer function from motion of the suspension point, say if you hold it from the ground, from ground motion to the, sur to the face of that optic, it falls like 1 over F squared. So at high frequencies, you get good noise suppression. The, the, the mass doesn't, the face of the optic doesn't follow the ground motion. At very low frequencies, it follows it one for one. And at, and at resonant frequencies, you actually amplify that motion. So you, if you get 1 over F squared from uh, a single pendulum, you get over 1 over f to the 8th isolation for a quad pendulum. And that's in fact what the test masses are. They're quad pendula. So you have blade springs suspending a table with 6 degrees of freedom of actuation, suspending another table, which suspend a penultimate mass, which has few silica fibers, which suspend the test mass. And so all of that is in order to suppress in-band motion. And, and you need active controls because there's many resonances associated with such a setup. So the resultant noise curve we uh, intend is this black dash one. And we're showing um, the initial goal of initial LIGO. And this is, um, 
This is now S5 and S6 curves, and Satya and I talked about, about the curves that he was showing. They, they were early S6 curves, that's why they're a little different. So this is really Livingston in S5 and Hanford in S6. So you can see there's more daylight there than you saw on the original plot. And again, the, the point is really they're, they're almost interchangeable, uh, the noise curves at the two sites during the, the best operation phases of S5 and S6. I do, so I'll show you that in a sec. <laughs> 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 uh, but with a very highly suspect calibration, a <laughs> big disclaimer on the, on the noise curve. Okay, so uh, you're seeing lots of features here, of course. There's, there's, uh, there's lines which come from uh, 60 hertz AC mains, there's, and it's harmonics. There's, um, there's m lines from an initial LIGO from the suspended wires that move the mirror like a reaction mass, uh, which causes length noise. So clearly we're not sensitive at 344 hertz because there's a host of uh, degenerate lines there. Uh, and there's some that we put in on a purpose for calibration, where we actually modulate the length degrees of freedom with a known actuation distance, usually something on the order of 10 to the minus 17 meters or so, such that we can um, check our calibration processes. And the reach in uh, initial LIGO, well, S5 was about 15, 16 megaparsecs, and S6 it was 20 megaparsecs. And so, in, in, so how do we, what's, what do you do to improve? Well, you need to decouple yourself better from the ground at low frequencies. And uh, to do that, we have these active seismic controls, which is necessary. And then at intermediate frequencies, we need um, better test masses and suspension to uh, reduce the thermal noise, that's the Brownian motion associated with the suspensions, and the uh, coatings on the optics and the rubbing in the suspension points and all of these combined thermal noise effects. And then at high frequencies, we go to higher power laser or, as Satya mentioned, uh, squeezing is another option in order to push on high frequencies or low frequencies or both in the case of a, a frequency independent squeezer. So we have these technologies in hand, as do the other detectors. I'm sorry, this is such a, a LIGO-centric talk. Uh, you could easily make a mirror talk for all the other detectors and show these um, components, beautiful components to have in hand. But this is the realization in LIGO, better seismic isolation. This clamshell device holds up a suspension system. We'll take a, lo a better look at it uh, later on, what that uh, optic test mass and penultimate mass and but ultimately, this is two suspended tables. It's like a, a main stage, suspended table one, suspended table two, all with uh, this 45 different degrees of freedom that are being under control here on this setup alone. And then the suspension system is all actively controlled as well. Uh, and so this, this, these systems are in place and are meeting their noise spec. And the place where we we worry, I mean, Satya told us about uh, gravitational gradient noise, and even if you have the best seismic isolator in the world, it can't stop gravitational gradient noise. You have to either go underground or suppress it in a feed-forward way. And low frequency tilt, tilt to length coupling, which is a big deal for systems with inertial detectors. So Krishna is going to come out and install this summer uh, a tilt meter, and that one is external to the vacuum. And so that's a great start, and we're looking forward to seeing that. However, the, the question is, will it be good enough? Because you have to get the thing, ideally you'd have it in vacuum to register the tilt that the actual platform that the optics affix to uh, and see their tilt such that you can suppress that. So that's the first stage. It's the first uh, kind of tilt meter that we'll put in. We're looking forward to that. At intermediate frequencies, we have the test mass itself, the 45 kilogram test mass, which is transparent to visible light, but uh, highly reflective for infrared light. Uh, this is the penultimate mass, and those are suspended together by fused silica fibers. So these are called ears that are um, uh, hydroxycatalysis bonded to the side of the optic. And then uh, we take glass stock and, and pull it with a computer system, um, heating it and pulling these fibers to a, a particular profile. And then we CO2 laser weld them to the upper stage, so this is at the penultimate mass, and then again at the lower stage, and you make these four different welds, and then you anneal it so that it hangs at the right angle, and then you can go ahead and install it. And lastly, the high, uh, uh, high frequency uh, performance comes from the high power laser, 
Uh, this is the 200 watt laser that was delivered by LZH and AEI in Germany. So with those systems in hand, we think we can get to the advanced LIGO noise curve. And this is the one that we keep showing this, um, sorry, neutron star, neutron star optimized green curve here. That's the one that we typically show. However, there's a whole host of different plots here. And in, in fact, this morning we saw maybe a little more optimistic than I'm going to show here too, in part because of the intricacies of turning the power up. So if you want to increase the power in the interferometer, what happens is you, uh, you kick up angular modes, so all the angular controls have to be in place and they have to, you have to make that sensing and, and you have to diagonalize your sensing, you have to have good controls and you can't induce more noise and you can't uh, cause radiation pressure at low frequencies and you have to, so the whole process of increasing the power in the laser is very difficult. So for us, with that high frequency is not necessary for, at least for first detection, uh, we are going to try to exploit the low frequency performance, the good decoupling that the seismic isolation and the suspension systems have, and the thermal noise that's associated with the optics and components in chamber, and weight on the hardest part, which is uh, increasing the power. So the first, what we think the first uh, advanced LIGO uh, science run will look like is a, is a curve that's shown here in pink, which is something that has you know, some range for binary neutron stars, something on the order of 80 megaparsecs, say, um, but uh, is not in any way the full blown curve. And, and it's only later that we'll uh, work on putting more than about 25 or 30 watts into the interferometer. So squeezing won't show up in the early stages? So squeezing is, is nominally not part of advanced LIGO. So it's envisioned as one of these enhanced advanced components. It's the first thing we would do and uh, we, uh, you, you know, we were asked why, why is Hanford late in a sense. It's, it's because we actually tested the sque a squeezer at Hanford. So in initial LIGO there was three interferometers at the two sites. So we chose to deinstall on one while we affixed a squeezer to the second. So that gave a whole year, year and a half of latency to the startup of the second interferometer as uh, an advanced LIGO machine. And so that whole purposeful, you needed to phase delay them anyways, because you're clearly going to learn things from one detector and not from the other. If you do everything in parallel, it's going to be, um, you, you basically want to learn everything you can as quickly as possible. So in fact, Hanford worked on long arms first and Livingston worked on the corner. So squeezing, yeah, it'd be the first upgrade you would make circa Depends. I mean, it depends what na how nature complies. If we get a lot of signals, you could imagine building some statistics rapidly and then making an upgrade li rapidly. However, it'll be harder to do if your l runs are getting protracted and you haven't seen something yet. It's a, a dynamic that cal the, uh, the collaboration is always working through when to run and when to shut down, uh, when, when to just uh, work. <laughs> And instrumentalists always want to try to improve something. Analysts need data. <laughs> it's a dynamic. So this is what we've been doing, pulling the initial LIGO out of the vacuum. We actually did major modifications to the vacuum envelope. This is an example of uh, extending the original two, uh, two kilometer, H to a second interferometer at LIGO Hanford, making it a four kilometer device. So the, the idea for LIGO India came late and uh, we were talking to Australia initially. That fell through. India stepped in and said, uh, we could uh, produce the $250 million in, in money required to make the, the site, the vacuum envelope, the, la the staff, all those things, the operation funding, if we get, uh, lend them the $80 million worth of advanced LIGO hardware. And so uh, this process is actually still when we envision the second interferometer being extended to four kilometers. Modifications in vacuum. And then we started installing and installing uh, detector components in place, and as I said, it's an iterative process of, of installation, getting some simple optical configuration together, uh, working on that, commissioning that, getting it to run, assessing its noise performance, and then feeding back into that process, installing elsewhere or modifying the components if we have problems. And we did have problems all along the way, of course. Um, 
10 times more sensitive makes it a lot harder than 10 times. This is the initial LIGO test mass suspension in an end station, and this is a setup for the installation in an end station. And there's a factor of 30 or so more parts, just parts alone. So if you just take the parts count, that's sort of what you're looking at, an order of magnitude or more. Uh, and so, uh, and all, you know, that, that's played out in you know, number of channels, number of filter banks. Uh, amount of data, all, all of these things, uh, number of test points, all these uh, parameters of which you have to address, assess the scaling of the machine. And we're worried about that. I must say that since I made this slide, I'm a little less worried because, well, because we locked last night, <laughs> for starters. <laughs> but uh, throughout the process, the, the actual commissioning process has generally gone faster. Installation has been um, arduous and at times slow, at times fast, but mostly delayed by things like, uh, sometimes just by sheer parts, sometimes by failures by us, where we broke fibers and had to go in and re-weld, um, and other times just, just because um, you know, the whole process was underestimated in terms of time. So, uh, but the fact that the commissioning and testing is going faster makes, that, that risk is not totally retired, but it's certainly more in hand. I think we started about mm -hmm. 10 minutes late, so yeah. six minutes late or something. Yeah. So I think I have 10 more minutes. So I'm just going to bang through some slides and show you some of the, in the, the commissioning and installation. Um, so Livingston was considered the pathfinder. They, go ahead, they, w they did their installation in a very natural way in that they started from uh, the corner stations. This is the schematic, the optical configuration. All of these optics are in the corner, and then you have the four kilometer arms, and at the end stations you have end test masses. <coughs> so Livingston built up from the pre-stabilized laser, the 1064 nanometer laser, then they added in input optics, then they added in uh, beam splitter and test masses, and then they added in the dark port or output port, and they first resonated light in the corner. At Hanford, because we were uh, maintaining one interferometer to apply a squeezer against, we worked on the second interferometer, so we just worked on the arms, and we actually built up one long arm. And in that, in that way, with this dual um, uh, installation and commissioning process, we, we hope to address and learn early about failures and problems in each of the systems, in the corner station optics and the RF servos that lock those systems, and in the arms, the test mass and the large suspensions and the large seismic isolation and something called the green laser locking or arm length stabilization that I'll show you a couple of slides on at the end um, in order to learn about that. And, and that mostly worked. I think that mostly worked in that we share information and try to move the other team along as quickly as, as they can. So Livingston starting in the vertex, Hanford starting in the arms. Um, just to show you the laser system, again, built by LZH and AEI. Uh, they, they built this first system at Livingston, then later on came uh, up to Hanford. It actually exists in its own clean room and acoustic uh, enclosure in the uh, main hall of the experiment. And that's mainly because it's open, the components are open, so there's one micron light circulating from the main laser to the high power stage through the diagnostic breadboard uh, the reference cavity, and then up the periscope and into the interferometer here through the wall of this acoustic enclosure. And you want to uh, uh, mitigate any coupling because if, the, if, if it's noisy in this room acoustically, then that uh, modifies the position of the mirrors on the table and lenses on the table, and that gets Doppler shifted in the light, and that's sent into the inter uh, interferometer, amplified, and then read out. And so in initial LIGO, if you talked at the gravitational wave port, and operators were listening to the dark port in, in the control room, they could hear what you said, <laughs> albeit completely garbled, but <laughs> they could make it out, typically. Um, so, okay, so that's in its own uh, enclosure, and it actually, this is an early noise spec, it basically meets its noise spec now. So I'll flash through. Once the uh, main laser was installed, then the smaller input optics and in smaller input chambers were installed. This is the installation of a seismic isolation platform on the small chambers. Instead of being suspended from above, like I showed you a few slides ago, this one is uh, supported from below, where there's optics, smaller optics, not test masses, but optics like 
uh, mode cleaning mirrors, triangular cavities that resonate the lowest order mode of the light of the laser, which constitutes in about 95% of the power of the laser, the lowest order mode, Hermit Gaussian mode, which is a cir circular mode and rejects higher order modes, which can pollute the noise spec of the interferometer. And so that's one, or the, the power recycling cavities or signal recycling cavities, they exist in these smaller chambers, single stage seismic isolations. That's one of the stacks going in right, on rails. Uh, this is the mode cleaner being tested. That's this triangular uh, resonant cavity which transmits only the lowest order mode and it meets its noise spec. Uh, Livingston then moved on to controlling all the degrees of freedom in the corner. So this is just with the arms subtracted. That's the light on DC photodiodes at the output port. And they've moved on from this noise curve too, So I'll show in a sec. Um, at Hanford, we um, first uh, resonated light in an arm. And um, I have a movie of all this if anyone's interested in seeing it. Um, and. Uh, installed components into the vacuum envelope. So these, you know, it's a class 1,000 clean room inside the chambers, 1,000 particles per cubic centimeter. And so there's all these protocols, and dust isn't a very sexy topic to talk about, but it's a really, really important one for an interferometer. We're way, you know, we have these very high specs. If you get dust on the optics, that both scatters light stochastically out of the beam, which is a problem. And secondly, if you put uh, kilowatts of hundreds of kilowatts of stored power on those mirrors, then um, you're going to bake uh, into the coatings any dust and particulates, and that spoils the properties of the coatings that you've uh, engineered. So, so it's a big deal, and we work very hard at it, and we're still too dirty. So we're always learning. We go to uh, um, NIF, National Ignition Facility, and learn from them, from Intel, from others, to, and our processes are, are showing that we're getting cleaner now because we're doing more and more in vacuum work to actually remove particulate. So, so everything... Does that mean that the motors have to keep running every now and then? Or how, how long can it turn off the vacuum pumps? Oh, so that's a, that's a, a gas issue. That's a, yeah. that's a different thing. So this is really particulate. So we're talking, okay. you know, tenth of a micron to several micron uh, large uh, diameter particles oh, okay. that are brought in by oh. us, by dirty human beings. And we ask Intel, how do you keep your spaces clean where you make chips? I'm like, ah, people don't go there. That's just the way everything's robotized. You know? <laughs> we can't afford that, <laughs> and we can't do it. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, so yeah, uh, so one is particulate. Two is pumping and gas. And so the, the, the way we control gas is through passive means. You can't pump on the tubes actively, so we use cryo traps. Uh, Virgo is installing cryo traps right now, for example. So there, you uh, flow liquid nitrogen over a cylinder, and as molecules are bouncing down the beam tube, they freeze against this cold trap. And so, to date, we can get away without actually fixing any ion pumps along the beam tubes. But we've had a, a, a leak, small set of leaks at Livingston, owing to moisture and rat piss and <laughs> other things, weld stress. At, uh, along the, the Livingston arms, and so we're actually maybe in a place where we'll attach ion pumps for um, the, at the you know, 2015 run. The only way to control these big particles is not to, not, to the first not to have them in the first place or remove them. I th it, we have to have we have them because mostly they c they come from a variety of sources from the op from the suspension systems, the aluminum, the steel, and the in the componentry, from the garb that we wear, from ourselves. How do you measure? How do you measure? So uh, v a myriad of techniques, but you know, the, a lot of them are, uh, are intended to pick up some particulate. So you can lay down wafers or glass inside the vacuum envelope as a witness. You can take it up with a, a special type of tape that pulls it up. We analyze it chemically. We analyze it in um, scanning electron microscopes, all in order to identify components, and we have pie charts for what component is human and what component is <laughs> about 6%, <laughs> and what component <laughs> is metals. The bulk of it is metals, about 35%. But it, it's, there's no like one smoking gun. If we just fix this, ah, we'd be clean. It's everything. So, okay, let me let me just finish with a couple of slides on arm length stabilization. I said we have green lasers at um, the end station. You saw that first slide with Corey lying down underneath this optical bench. Here's Keita 
Kawabe at Hanford working on this transmission monitor system which doubles as the injection point for a green laser into the arms. So in, in uh, initial LIGO, one of the problems, one of the things that took us longest to commission was to actually cause the first interferometer to resonate at light and be locked. And that we were stalled for sometimes months, uh, on the order of at least six months, maybe closer to eight really in which we hadn't resonated light in the arms and we're having trouble with that. And that pr part of the problem was that it was a stochastic process that the, the optics had to swing through resonance and build light and then for a millisecond you might build light on photodiodes and you had to have computer code that went through and caught that fringe and then added in the arms. And, and it was fragile and prone to falling apart because of um, misalignments and so forth. And so one of the reasons why the commissioning is going smoothly right now is because people thought, well, what's, what do we really need to work on? And lock acquisition was one of them. So the system that was devised for advanced LIGO is a green auxiliary laser in one end station, another green auxiliary laser in the other end station, and you inject this light in what's called a low finesse cavity. It's easy to lock. And, and so you control this cavity initially by changing the frequency of the green laser to match the swinging cavity, and then you transition to suppressing the motion of the test masses. And so you leak a little light through into the corner from one arm, you leak a little green light through uh, from the other arm into the corner. And you can take the laser and frequency double it, make it a set, put it through a second harmonic generator, so you have green light from the laser. So basically the beat frequency between the main laser and the locked arms tells you how far you have to push the main laser in, in frequency to match the resonant condition in the arm. And so it's sort of a smooth transition. We lock one arm with green, we lock the other arm with green, we, we frequency double the pre-stabilized laser, marry it to one arm, so slew that frequency, and then you, so you have a, a differential mode against the arm and a common mode in common if you beat the two green frequencies together. And so all of those things allow you to have enough degrees of freedom to suppress the motion. And the corner station gets locked on traditional RF techniques. And that process is in place and it's working at both sites. So that was a big deal. Let me finish here just saying that um, everything's installed at Livingston and they've been working on this locking at Hanford. Uh, everything's installed almost. Um, we're aligning these test masses right now and we're aligning this output stage. And on August 1st, we expect to pump the vacuum envelope down, and then we'll join uh, Livingston in the commissioning of the full interferometer. And as I said, it's locked. Um, it's from a couple of days ago. Um, take this calibration with a huge grain of salt. It's <laughs> claims were accurate to kiloparsecs. We're probably not accur accurate to plus or minus a factor of two in megaparsecs. So the, the, the scale is very suspect. But the, the point is uh, we're locked. We have some broadband performance. It's not taken particularly long to do this. Um, we basically started the locking, full locking in April at Hanford, so uh, at Livingston rather, and so it took about six weeks to get the first lock, which was very fast. And they've made some improvements in, in the noise and, and very quickly the whole process will transition once stabling, stable locking is autom uh, automated to pushing down the noise level in the interferometer. Back up 10 in one month? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It depends on, the, it could be all in the calibration. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how much are you better at the low end now? It looks like it's, it's a yeah, magnitude here, looks so like, but again, like yeah, right. About an order of magnitude from there to there, say. I was even looking even lower. Oh, okay, yeah, here. Well, again, so the calibration at, at, I wouldn't, you know, we probably have a good handle on the calibration at a kilohertz, and people are saying the calibration is good to about a factor of two. What it is at 20 hertz, I, you know, I couldn't say it really. That takes a fair amount of systematic study to, to know the frequency response of the machine and then assess the systematic as a function of frequency. It's probably not crazy, but, you know, it's, it may not even, it may be worse than a factor of two at 20 hertz. Probably the guys who put it together, guys and gals, would say, yeah, something, but something on the, the initial lag curve is off the scale. It's first. Yeah. Factor of two is nothing on the scale. <laughs>
I think Virgo has the world record at low frequencies <laughs> with their uh, multi-stage passive seismic isolation, 12-stage passive seismic isolation. I don't think we're past that. So I, I have more slides, but why don't I stop there because I'm out of time. So. So you mind, what, what are the remaining key challenges before you go down to the design curve, uh, even early in Lyco? Right. So, um, well, right now, it, it just in a sense, it depends on what is lying underneath. What's the noise underneath? If we're, we could be lucky, and we're seldom lucky, but we're, we could be lucky, and you exploit low frequency performance pretty rapidly because there's nothing technical and loud that's holding you up there. And so the matter of you know, closing loops on all these different subsystems and getting them to their design spec carves out a significant portion at low frequencies. That would be the lucky scenario. The hard part would be if you get something that you don't understand and will definitely hit something along the way that we don't understand initially. The most insidious kinds are the kinds of up-converted up noise. And so um, you may have some excess noise that comes at very low frequency, way below this, down in the millihertz regime. But that gets expressed at 100 hertz by some uh, nonlinear process <laughs> that people typically don't understand. Uh, an example uh, um, that we saw in advanced LIGO and understood at some level was Barkhausen noise, where you get domain flipping in magnets. So if you have actuation at in the millihertz regime to suppress microseism, which is you know, storms off the coast of the Aleutian Islands or storms off the coast of Alaska, beat in a resonant fashion against the continental shelf and squeeze the Earth uh, every seven seconds, the, con the continent every seven seconds. So you can put a good low frequency seismometer down the ground, you can find the microseism anywhere in the world. Uh, but we would have to control and suppress that low frequency motion and during times of high microseism, that noise at low frequencies would be upconverted into the 90 hertz, 80 hertz regime with some noise, uh, you know, characteristics, some color, and it would dominate at uh, 90 hertz. We could tell that was Barkhausen noise, but we weren't ever totally able to nail it down. It, it was so it was right at the design level in in advance in initial LIGO. So we hope not to hit something that hard. <laughs> In the, in the short term, but that's, it's, it's always there, right? You, you just don't know what you're going to hit. Um, so here's, here's uh, initial LIGO in green, and then there's the uh, um, enhanced LIGO uh, in our sixth science run where we did things like uh, add DC readout, because that was one of the key technical things we were going to do in advanced LIGO, and we weren't sure how it would operate. We used uh, the initial stage, the 35 watt laser for advanced LIGO, and we use a single seismic, active seismic isolation stack at, at the dark port. And so we got the factor of two improvement that we expected at high frequencies, but at 90 hertz we didn't get anything, and we were probably limited by some comp complicated summation of sources that we didn't quite understand. Certainly at times of high macroseism we were limited by Barkhausen noise. So how far are we going to get, or what's the most difficult thing? It's hard to say. Right now, we, I would say the main threats for us is one, we're open at Hanford right now. So that's the time when things tend to go wrong, like you're manipulating optics and you've got tools and fasteners above the level of the optic, and they're protected by catch pans and all these things, but it's the kind of time that you could genuinely lose eight to 10 weeks just because you broke a fiber. So that's a big threat for us right now. But once you're under vacuum, that threat largely goes away. Geo's had suspended fibers for something on the order of 15 years, and they've only had maybe one incident in which they had a break under vacuum. So, um, so we think then it's really in that commissioning phase. And then, you know, it's hard to tell. Right now, there, there's not something holding us up. We have worries, um, coding. Uh, for optics for India, a, a big deal. The transmissivity of the end mirrors was quite high, so it was out of spec by a factor of three to five. It depends on the mirror. Um, and uh, so the, uh, we have excess transmission of green, which makes a very low finesse cavity. So the arm length stabilization, um, we had to work around that to get it to work right. 
uh, magnetic coupling. There's a possibility there might be excess magnetic coupling down at 10 hertz, so we're always injecting uh, electromagnetic interference and seeing how it couples into the test mass. We'll learn about that as we go. But no, nothing that we know of right now that's significant. So another naive question. You, it looks, you have three handles here on shaping the sensitivity curve. Right. The improvement that you showed us with the latest run was at low frequency. Right. Uh, what, are, what are the things one does to actually see if these three uh, better test mass suspension is actually going to move the curve down? Yeah, okay. So that whole process is really the commissioning process where you um, or is it best described? So you basically you make a, a series of simple experiments and then you build a noise budget and you sum those noises in quadrature and see does your model noise look like the interferometer noise. So um, here's an example of some noise. The summation of the gold curve and the purple curve gives the, the, length, the length noise in that system. In this system, um, yeah, here's the measured noise in cyan, and here's the uh, sum in blue. And so there's some excess here at low frequencies. But over on the whole, this um, summed noise curve matches up the, the, um, the actual data pretty well. And so you know the, the, if the lion's share is intensity noise here, the green curve, that's the place you have to work. That's what you have to do. Even though, so that intensity noise, that's, that's the amplitude noise and the laser itself being injected into the interferometer and causing common mode disturbances in the, in the interferometer. If you don't push on that, you're not going to do any good. It does no good to mess around with any of these other noise terms. And so, yeah, that's, that's basically the, the ploy is that you have to you do simple experiments to set calibrated contributions and then sum them. Can we go to the last uh, noise curve? Sure. Okay, so at high frequencies, like a few kilohertz, right. these uh, uh, large spikes of noise, uh, so they seem to be most of them stationary. But are they uh, particular to this detector? If you yeah. would uh, look would they be at exactly the same yeah, I would, I would, yeah, it's very hard to say right now, given it's just the first noise curve. It's, on, it's, it's certainly something that's completely out of spec. It could be some sort of scattered noise. It could be acoustic noise. It could be uh, mechanical modes of systems that have to be properly damped. We're certainly not, you know, we're not particularly worried about that. Just no time has been invested in looking at those, those um, noise sources. And so we're not, we haven't chased them yet. So, so I would guess that some of them would match up with the, their counterpart in Hanford because we use the same periscope that's got the similar you know, resonant behavior at 70 hertz. It, it's going to wave around and it's going to inject noise into the interferometer and produce a peak at 70 hertz. But, uh, but all of them would not necessarily be the same. Some of them might be particular to the acoustic environment at Livingston, the setup, how light is scattering, the it could be a function of alignment. Um, but I wouldn't, we're not, I wouldn't be worried about this at all. It's just, it just re reflects a completely raw spectrum that was taken in a couple hours worth of data on really the first time that they'd ever achieved that, that level of, of locking, that length of lock. So we'll have plenty of work to do. I mean, we could show you a plot where in initial LIGO, in the first few years of initial LIGO, there's lots of line noise sources. And some of them you just live with because you know you've got a plan to swap out a given p power supply, <laughs> for example. And that goes away as soon as you switch over to something without a transient. So if you would run a network of detectors, and even if in one detector you have some noise that is blocked, they could be still fine. Absolutely. I mean, the, the crab pulsar is a good example of that. The nature's capricious and twice the rotation frequency of the crab is very near 60 hertz. <laughs> so Virgo will have a much better chance of seeing gravitational waves from, from the crab pulsar than, than anything in North America, say. So again, on, on, on spikes, because 
you know. Theoretically, we, we, we find it interesting because the signal will have spikes itself. Um, and, and because of Satya's comment that, you know, if you have spikes and then you're looking for spikes, then maybe there is a conflict there. So how large are these spikes normally? I mean, are you looking at 100 hertz or 10 hertz? It, so it, it's completely a function of the source. Um, I, I don't want to spend any time talking to, to these particular lines okay, so because the, the because it's just it's just so raw. I mean, it's it's a day is old, and I got it out of the log. Um, but if you look at uh, the history and in initial LIGO, where you have, you know, some of these are extremely broad, many hertz, tens tens of hertz. Sorry, where, where are you pointing? Three hundred forty-four hertz. This broad, yeah. that's a mechanical structure. It's the lowest order violin mode of the wires that suspend an optic. Okay. And so that is going to pollute in a broadband way. There's 16 lines there um, that are largely degenerate. But uh, they're going to uh, pollute a whole host of frequency bands. So that's I think the Pulsar group, for example, mm -hmm. they would excise about 2 hertz worth of data, I think. Even though they, you know, their source in principle, you know, is Doppler modulated and amplitude modulated. Uh, we just take that group right out. Whereas others, if it's if it's due to some GPS clock, then it can be, you know, essentially a single bin in width, all con all confined to a single bin. Um, in that case, you go after that by looking at the hardware and seeing if you can mitigate that clock source. Let's be more specific. Um, uh, let's have a look at. Two kilohertz and higher. Those features there are this one here, for example. So that that's a that's a that's an example of a, a, a extremely thin line. Uh -huh. um, it's a calibration line that we put in. I so we actually modulate the arm lengths mm -hmm. in order to track the optical gain. The optical gain may change as a function of alignment, and the alignments tend to drift a little through the running of the interferometer over hours. And so this height of that peak gives us the optical gain changes in the instrument, first order. And so, um, yeah, that's something we inject with a digital control system. It's a digital signal that's applied. We know it. We can back it out. If there's something interesting, we can move it. Um, so so th those are, are thin. And, but at high frequencies, you also get, you can get shelves of noise. This is a shelf, something large and wit wide in amplitude there. And that's some pathology. I'm actually forgetting what those specifically were from initial LIGO. You can see they're in Livingston, but not in Hanford in this particular case. OK, I have also another question about um, wh what happened to the second in, uh, arm? I mean, you, you said you had a second interferometer. Oh, know? yeah. OK, so those are the parts for India. That's right. So Where there's all, they're, they're at Hanford. They're, they uh, they're, they're, they're assembled. No, no, no. They're largely they're assembled. assembled. They're largely <laughs> assembled. I would say. I actually don't know as a percentage exactly. It's something on the order of 80% assembled. Uh -huh. uh, we're making the last seismic isolation platforms right now in our staging building. And we're putting them in clean new storage bins and circulating uh, nitrogen. There's a nitrogen purge over them in order to prepare them for shipping, shipping to India. So what do we know about that? You said a decision is going to be taken. When, when, do we know when it's going to be taken? What are the They're looking at the wrong person. But okay. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll it the but I think, uh, to be fair, I mean, we, there is a new government in the end. But uh, okay. what we feel is that there's not no no project that has gone this far in the Indian system and been captured. Mm -hmm. uh, because it has been through some of the preliminary scientific other Although there is something called media project in the that needs to be submitted. So I, so I guess what I can say, but uh, am I on record here? <laughs> 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 I can just <laughs> shut this off one sec. Yeah, just shut that off. You don't want to be on record. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, I think we should. One sec. But, yeah. Yeah, so